Good morning, good morning. Welcome to New Mercies this morning. It's good to see everybody. We're starting to fill the pews in a little bit more every week. Let's take a moment and bring the uh, worship this morning to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to get together this morning, and we just ask that you'd be with each of us here. And we pray that you'd guide and direct us as we listen to the pastor's word, and that that word might reach our heart, and we'd carry it with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to get together this morning and to share worship with one another. We know what a privilege this is, and we're so thankful that you have given us new mercies and that you're here with us and that you're leading, guiding, and directing all of us. Father, we all have concerns that we need prayer for, and we just ask that you'd be with the hearts of each and every member of New Mercies, that you would listen to our hearts and help us resolve the issues that are there. We pray then specifically for Mr. Taylor and his kidney transplant and that uh, the rejection he's experiencing would go away. Father, we just pray that you'd uh, put your hand on him. And we also pray for Larry and the uh, kidney, or I'm sorry, the cancer diagnosis that he's had. And we would just ask, Father, for your, uh, your healing hand to be on him. And we also pray for Jessica in Washington State, who's, uh, who's run astray a little bit, God. And we know that um, with prayer, we can help bring her back. And we just ask, Father, that you'd be with her as well. We know, God, that you're the awesome healer. And we just thank you and praise you in advance for the things you're going to do for these people, that we might be able to hold them up as examples of your mercy. We just give praise and thanks for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ethan Maynard, correct? correct. Ethan is um, your prison minister, so act like you're uh, in prison here this morning. We'll make you feel more at home. Um, <laughs> if there's anything we can do for you, but we'll leave it to you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege and blessing to be here this morning. Uh, I often drive by this church on my way to work because I just work here at the county jail. Uh, it's actually the Geauga County Safety Center is the official name, but it's the county jail. And uh, I drive on Butternut Road, then I make a turn up on Aquila and then over on Ravenwood and I'm right there. And so I pass by this little church almost every week and I'm always wondering, what's it look like inside? <laughs> well, now I know. <laughs> it looks very pretty in here. Uh, I got to know Pastor Roy through the pastor prayer lunch that they have once a month up at Chardon Christian Fellowship. Um, pastor Wayne hosts that once a month, and I got to know Pastor Roy through that. And he invited me to speak once before, and I had to turn him down because of some family commitments. But I said, Roy, keep me on your short list. So he did, and I'm here. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. Before I get into this message, let's go to the... Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just uh, ask that he would bless the reading of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to the folks at New Mercies. And God, I just pray that as we get into your word, that you would just minister to our hearts, that you would convict us, that you would teach us your truth, that you would take us where you want us to go. God, I pray that we would be Flexible, Lord, to, to your Holy Spirit. And God, Lord, when we look at this world, we see such a lack of peace. We see so much turmoil. God, help us to rest in the peace that is only found in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about peace. It's been a subject, it's been weighing on my heart a lot these last few weeks, especially in light of all the different circumstances that we've seen in our world. We've seen just this whole onslaught with the coronavirus. We've seen all the changes to daily life. And now we see this, this guy getting killed up in Minneapolis, um, George Floyd. And then we see the reaction to that, all these people that are really angry, the riots. And there's been circumstances in my own personal life. There's been a, I had an uncle that died last week and another man who I'm very close to who is on hospice. And everywhere I turn, it seems like there's a challenge to peace, right? Or at least what I qualify as, as peace. But what I wanna share with you today is what the real basis of peace is and then, in light of that, what is our responsibility as, as believers? So, the Bible says <laughs> that the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. That's found in James 1.20. The anger of man, or the wrath of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. 
And one thing I see in this world today is just anger. You know, I even see it in myself sometimes, but there's this tremendous anger. What's going to make that better? And I'm convinced that peace cannot be achieved through angry protests or enacting any amount of new laws or political change. These things really can't bring peace because those things can't really change a person's heart. They can't really get a person to look at the next person differently because peace needs to come from the inside and flow to the outside, not the other way around. So it's obvious as this world rages and boils with unrest that something is missing in people's hearts. Why do people hate their fellow man? Why can't we end racism? Why can't we put an end to war? I'm convinced the biblical answer is simple. It's because people need Jesus Christ. Before we surrender our life to Jesus, our lives are not all they should be. We're not all who God created us to be. There's something empty inside. As Billy Graham used to like to say, there's a God-shaped void in our heart. And that's a peace that only Jesus Christ can bring. I tell you a story. This could be any Christian story, but I was a rebel against God. My selfishness, pride, and wickedness separated me from the Father's love. In comparison to the holiness of God, my sin was as dark as night. I stood guilty in my rebellion and deserving of wrath. There was absolutely nothing I could do about it. The more I tried to lift myself up, the more I stumbled. Yet while I was still in this condition, Jesus died in my place, the death I deserved to win my peace with God. He has built a bridge of salvation through his death and resurrection. Jesus poured out his precious blood on the cross for me. He took on the full wrath of God for me to achieve the ultimate pardon. And he rose again so I can walk in newness of life. See, Jesus is the one that brings that ultimate peace. Without him, we're enemies with God. Without him, we're separated from God's love. Only Jesus can bring that peace. Only Jesus can do what needs to be done to achieve that. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. See, peace doesn't come merely from good feelings. Because guess what? Feelings are fickle. Feelings can change day to day. One day you're feeling high, the next day you're brought low. And all it can take is one little thing to, to knock over those dominoes. <laughs> Nor does peace flow from altruistic values, because guess what? Cultures change, societies change, and the value systems change. What might have been viewed as good 20 years ago now is viewed as bad, or vice versa. What they said, that's absolutely wrong 20 years ago. Now people are dancing in the street saying it's okay. You can't base it on society's values or what they say is good. Here's what you have to base it on is a transformed relationship, the transformation that only Jesus can bring. Jesus is the great physician that can perform the heart surgery we need. He alone can remove the heart of darkness and put in a heart of flesh. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else even makes that claim. Only Jesus can do that. John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Life and peace come through the one and only Son of God. Isaiah 26, 1 through 4. In that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. I love this passage because it shows, even in the Old Testament, who that everlasting rock is. <laughs> Salvation is only found in the Lord. And Jesus said, I am the rock. 
You know, building on anything else is shifting sand. Jesus said, I am the rock. You know, there's peace to be found if, if you have security, but there's only eternal security in one. <laughs> That's the Lord. He's the only one that offers that eternal security, that real safety, that you can run into his fortress and truly be safe. No matter what the w world throws at you, you can truly be safe in him. See, peace is found when you are perfectly secure and the Lord is the only source of eternal security. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, the world bases peace on outside factors. For example, the world says, you know, if you've got the right house and you've got the right job, so you've got money in the bank, and you've got your health, and you've got the right car, you've got the right relationship, and your kids behave, then you'll have peace. <laughs> right? <laughs> then you'll have peace. Then you can lay back on your hammock with your lemonade, and your life is at peace. But guess what? None of these things is a guarantee. In fact, I make the opposite guarantee that one of these things is bound to go wrong. <laughs> or maybe all of the above at some point in your life. And then where's the peace? Also, what if you were born in another country, impoverished, on the street, in the slums, and that you're being told your whole life that peace is achieving the American dream, having X, Y, Z. Is that really the message that, that peace is? See, see what happens and see why that's a problem? This is uh, the world's message of peace and it's very problematic. <laughs> but the peace that Jesus offers is not dependent on any of these things. Jesus said the peace that I offer you is peace even in the eye of the storm. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or anything like that. It's all about where your heart's at. And if your heart is with Jesus Christ, your heart's at peace. And you can withstand any of these things. See, his peace is internal and eternal. And all that other peace I was talking to you about, that's just external stuff. And it's not lasting. I could walk out of here today, and I don't see very many Mack trucks on Aquila Road. This example works better when I'm on 44, but I could walk out today and get hit by a Mack truck on Aquila Road, and what if I didn't have that relationship with Christ? It doesn't matter how much I've stored up in my barns here, as Jesus told the parable of the rich farmer, it's all gone. I can't take it with me when I go. But I can take that relationship with Jesus Christ and everybody else that I tell about Jesus, they're coming along too. Praise God. So don't seek counterfeit peace. I urge you, brothers and sisters, don't seek counterfeit peace that the world offers because it's not lasting and it's not truly fulfilling. John 16:33. <laughs> Jesus says, you probably know this one, I've said these things to you, that you in me, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen? See, Jesus is the ultimate overcomer. The, the devil threw every temptation at him, but Jesus overcame. Then he overcame the greatest obstacle of all by carrying the burden of our sins to the cross and dying for our sins and then rising the third day. <laughs> Jesus conquered sin and death. Now, if you want to make it to the top of Mount Everest, you want to make sure that you go with a highly trained, highly experienced guide, right? A Sherpa to take you up to the top of Mount Everest. You're not going to attempt that journey you know, with somebody that's never been up to the top before, you want somebody that's conquered the mountain, right? Otherwise, you try to go up to the top of Mount Everest, you're gonna become like all those bones that you see on the trail that they can never clean up. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Jesus is the ultimate overcomer. If you wanna be an overcomer, you need to hook your wagon to Jesus. He is the ultimate overcomer. That's the one that I wanna follow if I wanna overcome. Jesus alone has a peace that can defy everything that's going on around. He's conquered the mountain. 
Jesus has already conquered the mountain. So try to make that journey with him. Psalm 4.8, it says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. You know, a lot of people struggle with sleep at night. Uh, you know, I was talking about all this turmoil going on in the world, and I've talked to so many people who are like, I, I just cannot sleep. Well, the psalmist here, I think it's David, he says, I can rest easy and I can sleep at night because God is the one that brings me peace. I've given all, everything to him. You know, all my worries, all my doubts, all my anxieties, I've given them to him. And now I can lay my head on the pillow and I can sleep. That's what we need to do, folks. You know, we have a deep yearning for peace. I think it's at the heart of almost every person to, to find peace. But that's at odds with the reality that we see in the world. That's not the reality. Just as the prophet Jeremiah said, this world cries peace, peace, when there is no peace. It's a false sense of security to place hope in anything other than Jesus Christ. When the world says, well, we're closer now to peace than we ever were before, don't, don't buy it. <laughs> don't buy what they're selling. It's not true. We can't find a false sense of security. We gotta place everything with Jesus. Some people proclaim the need for what they call tolerance. I'm putting that in quotation marks because a lot of times what they say is tolerance means you gotta endorse their view and their agenda at the cost of everybody else. And then you need to show the other group intolerance. That's not what the Bible says is real tolerance. Real tolerance is showing everybody the love of Jesus Christ but without compromising this message. See, Jesus doesn't take political sides, and Jesus shows that the lasting peace is only found in him. That's what he's all about. He never gives a false sense of security because the things that he offers are eternal. He says that there is gonna be hardship. <laughs> he says in this world you will have tribulation. He's not gonna sugarcoat it He's not going to make it out to be something it's not. He doesn't say it's going to be, you know, a bed of roses and an easy walk. He says, you're going to have hardships. If you serve me, people are going to persecute you. But you can be an overcomer and you can have peace inside. So what is the Christian's responsibility in all this? You know, we've looked that the basis of peace is Jesus Christ. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, right? What is the Christian's responsibility, that being the case? And I've got some verses here too, but we have to remember that everything that we do to try to work out peace flows from the peace that Jesus has already extended to us. If you don't have that peace in your heart, you're not gonna have the reservoir from which to give that peace to other people. See, the peace that we give others is in direct response to what Jesus has already done in our life. If you serve, the King, Jesus, you understand that he has achieved something we never could achieve on our own. That's salvation. What, we do to share this, what do we do to share this gift with others? The Bible says that we are to pass along peace and proclaim peace to be found in Jesus Christ. Practice forgiveness even when it's not deserved. Violence begets violence. Hostility breeds hostility. Anger fuels anger but the peace of Christ can break the chain. And that alone can break the chain. You know, if one guy treats me with anger and I respond in anger, it's not gonna solve anything and it's not gonna bring any peace. It's just gonna continue that cycle. You know, if somebody slaps me on one side and I slap him on the other side, the, you know, the cycle of anger continues. <laughs> you see, a relationship with Christ not only affects me, it affects how I treat my fellow man. As a brother and a person in need, just like me, I was a rescued sinner. That guy over there, he's a sinner in need of rescuing. You see how it changes the whole perspective? I mean, it's only because of Jesus Christ that I can go out there and offer peace to people. If I didn't have this relationship with Jesus, I, I know I'd be a selfish, terrible person. But because of this, you know, I can go and I can treat people differently, even if they don't deserve it. 
even if I'm not feeling it that day. And trust me, some days I'm not feeling it. But I go to the Lord, and he changes me. <laughs> Colossians 3.13, it says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. See, our forgiveness flows from the forgiveness Jesus has already given us when we didn't deserve it. Romans 12, 18 through 21, it says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, there is so much practical wisdom here concerning peace. I'm just going to offer a few comments on this, but this, is, this, one, this one passage alone could preach. But it says, if at all possible, live at peace with all men. You know, of anybody, Christians are spo supposed to pursue peace. It's supposed to show what Christ is like to people. And it says, beloved, never avenge. Leave it to the wrath of God. You know, we don't need to seek that vengeance or try to even the score because God is the one ultimate keeping, ultimately keeping score. You know, I, I used to go to baseball games and I like to try to keep score. And invariably, when you're at a baseball game, you're going to mess up a little bit. You're going to lean over to your buddy and say, was that a double or was that a single and an error? You know, or what happened? Because I was getting popcorn. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You know, you mess up when you try to keep score. You only can see it from your perspective and a little, a little bit of what's going on. But God sees everything that's going on. He's the perfect scorekeeper. And he promises to be the perfect judge. So we don't have to sit around and try to keep score on people. God's got it all in his hands. Which are way, he's way more capable than we are. And here's this whole thing about treating your, your enemy with love. That's uh, different than the world, right? The world says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Even here, you know, 3,000, 4,000 years after that was written. <laughs> the world's still operating on that same standard. But Jesus said, treat your enemy with love. Kill him with kindness. It says here, they'll put burning coals on his head, but our idiom, our English expression is kill somebody with kindness. You know, show them the love of Jesus, but make it sincere so much to an extent that they'll be embarrassed. They'll be like, I keep treating this guy bad. I keep, you know, using the worst possible words and I keep doing the worst possible things in their presence. I'm trying to get them down, but man alive, I can't get them to crack. You know, this Jesus thing must really be real. <laughs> and finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I, I see in that part, you know, we got to remember whose side we're on. You know, Satan likes to bluster. He likes to put it out there with a lot of bravado. He likes to throw his weight around. So a lot of times we think Satan's winning in this world <laughs> or in general. But here's the deal. God still has over two-thirds of the angels. The devil only has one-third. Which side wins? <laughs> God wins. Jesus wins. In fact, he's already won. You know, I want to I'll make sure I always remember that because we serve the, the king who's won. We're on the winning side. We don't have to go around acting defeated. We've, we're on the winning side already. So don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God is stronger. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I like how it's using that word publishes because it's this bold proclamation. It's putting it out there with boldness. But what do we need to proclaim with boldness? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Because unless we share that with people, they're not going to have that peace. 
And we have a responsibility, not to hide that, not to keep that to ourselves, but to show people the one way that they can have peace is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, and if you do that, your feet are going to be considered beautiful by God because you're going on his mission to bring people this peace. That's probably the most important thing that you can do for a person. It's actually not showing somebody peace when you fail to want to do that in somebody's life. Because if I see somebody in need and I don't want to offer them the one thing that's going to give them lasting peace, that, it's kind of selfish of me. It's kind of mean-spirited of me. But when I see that person needs Jesus Christ in their life and I, I boldly share the gospel with them, I'm doing the most peaceful thing I possibly can. I'm giving them a means to have peace. How else would they get it? It's not going to just come through osmosis. <laughs> They're not going to just get it out of the blue. It only comes through purposeful sharing. James 3:13 through 18 says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, I see two things on opposing sides here, all right? On one side, it describes selfishness and seeking your own agenda and not caring about other people, putting yourself first. And if I do that, if I'm always putting myself first, there's not going to be peace. I see even little microcosms of this in my life when I am selfishly trying to get something done and I'm not caring about maybe what my wife needs or what my kids need and there's you know turmoil in the house all right there's a lack of peace but even on a bigger scale in this world when people are always seeking their own agenda we're not going to have peace it's only from pursuing God and his agenda that we can have peace not my will be done but your will be done you know it's it's his kingdom <laughs> not my kingdom and then the wisdom from above comes through the Holy Spirit being at work in our life. It's more of him and, and less of me. It's when the Holy Spirit takes control and then I can start to bear this spiritual fruit. You know, whether it's the peace or whether it's the wisdom of God, the mercy, the impartiality. All these things come through the Holy Spirit being at work. And I like this last line. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Romans uh, 8, 5 through 6 says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. You see, this peace can't be achieved outside of the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can struggle all we want, but God's got to do something supernatural. It's got to be from the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that people get Jesus in their life, because without Jesus in their life, they're not going to have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They're just going to keep on doing the fleshly thing. Why do we expect more? I need to stop expecting so much from people that are living in the flesh. I somehow expect people living in the flesh to act like a Christian, and it's kind of silly of me. Right? They're going to do what the flesh is demanding until they get the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You know, this is all about testimony. The testimony of, of a believer. That if, if you go out there and, and you show people peace, they're going to see Jesus Christ. But if you go out there and act like everybody else, they're going to be like, oh man, that guy's just another one of those Christian hypocrites. You know, if you you know, do an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or you just treat somebody in anger that treats you in anger, you're not 
any different, and I'm not any different than the next guy out there. You know, what would differentiate us? We look the same. So we got to look different. We got to pursue Jesus' peace and Jesus' holiness. Otherwise, people aren't going to see the Lord in us. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Now, in conclusion today, I have two verses, which are actually benedictions in the Bible. And the interesting thing about these benedictions is I've noticed that a lot of benedictions in Scripture have peace as a part of the, the benediction, right? You often see in the movies, you know, the, the priest or the monk will say, you know, peace be upon you. I mean, there's all, all sorts of benedictions talk about peace. But now we've looked at how peace is rooted in Jesus Christ, that he is the source of peace. He is the one that sustains our peace and what it looks like as a Christian to live with peace. So I think it's fitting that we look at a couple benedictions that have peace in here. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. A one word that jumped out to me on that verse was restoration. You know, restoration, whether you're restoring an old car or a house or maybe a property, it takes a lot of work. Restoration is not easy. It takes patience. It takes time. It takes commitment. It takes relationship. You got to really be prepared to, to do what it takes to restore anything. And Jesus said, you know, we got to be about the work of restoration. And I think that's what peace is. You're showing people what reconciliation is with God. Restoring what was lost at the fall. Because God desperately wants to have a relationship with his creation. But you got to have that peace that can only be found through Jesus Christ. Last, 2 Thessalonians 13, 16. 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians 13, 16 says this, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Let's do prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much that you offer us a peace and a security far surpassing anything this world can ever comprehend or offer. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you too for taking, making that sacrifice on our behalf and going up and, and dying on the cross for our sins. And Lord, rising again from the grave so we can walk in your newness of life. God, I just pray for these folks, God, that they would be all about sharing your peace that flows from that relationship we have with you. God, help us to be the peacemakers of the world. Help us to help the world to see us as different because we, we have your peace reigning in our hearts. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.